morning and welcome to the February 22nd, 2022 City Council Work Session. Thank you for joining us in this remote meeting format we're using as our state and community continue to deal with the COVID-19 pandemic. This format enables the City Council to meet and take care of business while keeping everyone safe. For those uh, work sessions like this one where there is no opportunity for public comment, those wishing to access the meeting can do so by watching the live stream available on our website, the broadcast on Comcast Channel 21, or by calling into the one of the phone numbers listed for this meeting on the public webcast and meeting materials web page. And thank you again for joining us on this cold, sunny evening. And uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to the city manager for our one and only work session. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I also put a quick note in the chat that uh, Councillor Evans needs the meeting link if somebody could send that to him from staff. So I'm um, looking forward to tonight's discussion and I believe Will Dowdy is going to kick us off. So welcome, Will. We'll just jump right to you. Great, uh, thank you very much. Good evening, Council and Mayor. It's a pleasure to be with you tonight. I'm Will Dowdy. I'm part of a community, de community development team that is here to talk with you about three applications for the multi-unit property tax exemption program, also known as MUPTI. With me this evening are uh, three others from the team, Amanda D'Souza, Dylan huber Heidorn, and Ann Fifield. There's a, a work session scheduled on March 9th for you to review these three applications in more detail and deliberate and possibly take action. In preparing for that, we realized how much material there was for you to consider, and we decided we wanna help you walk through that. Atkins Dame submitted MUPTI applications for three buildings all at the same time. It's a lot, but there have been some efficiencies as we've been processing them together. Today, we'll introduce you to the three projects and show you how they've addressed all the criteria in the MUPTI program without presupposing that you've had the chance to really dig into the packet. We want you to get the information you need, have a chance to ask questions, and then we'll return in a couple of weeks with the city manager recommendation, a finalized MUPTI review panel report, and you can add all that to your conversation. Before we start and get into the specifics of the MUPTI conversation, I'd like to give you an update on the various goings on at the downtown riverfront site. First, the finishing touches are being added to the park and we're looking forward to the opening on a warm and sunny day this spring. The streets and the infrastructure are looking great and the construction team is getting ready for everything, uh, for all of it to be open so that people can get to the park and get through the site. The steam plant, the big news here is something that you know quite well. Um, you took action on this to approve deal points with the Dream Plant team last month. Now we're, we're now working with them on due diligence and the legal agreements. In July, Oregon 22 begins and the city will host a fan fest at the riverfront. We're working closely with the Atkins Dame team who now owns some of the property to make an event that can bring the whole community together. Just like the steam plant, the affordable housing component is one of the pieces that we are bringing back to the agency board in greater detail. And we hope to have that for you by late spring. And there's the multifamily development by Atkins Dame. And they hope to have the first two buildings beginning construction by the end of the summer. In 2018, you approved deal points to sell land to Atkins Dame who had been selected through an RFP process to build out the community vision for the site. At the time, it seemed like a long road ahead but with a lot of hard work and collaboration, we've covered considerable ground since that day. We've built the infrastructure in the park, investing millions of dollars to extend downtown to the river and attract private investment many times over the investment that you've put into this. We received a four and a half million dollar non-refundable deposit from Atkins Dame. We sold the first set of parcels to Atkins Dame in November. They've also completed designs for three of the buildings and one of the final conditions is Council's consideration of the MUPTI applications, which is the focus of our discussion today and then at the subsequent work session in March. I've introduced our team, talked a little bit about the site. Now let me briefly reacquaint you with the, the three sites that we're considering. Parcel 3BC, which is the one on the upper left, it's got a funny name because at one time it was planned to be two separate parcels with lower density buildings on them. This parcel abuts 4th to the north, Mill to the east, and 5th Avenue to the south. The southwest corner of the building will greet everyone crossing into the area from this end of downtown. And the northeast corner of the building 
will mark the major vehicular entry point on Mill Street. Next is parcel seven, right in the middle. It sits at the eastern end of Fifth Avenue. From the Whitaker past Willamette Street, this is where one of the city's great streets intersects with the Riverfront Park. And turning into the park and heading upriver, or to the right, you arrive at parcel nine, which looks out over the river path and provides spatial definition to the park and helps you along towards the steam plant, which you can see in blue on the, towards the bottom right-hand corner. So those are the properties we're gonna be talking about tonight. Um, you'll be quite familiar with three BC, seven and nine by the time we're done. Uh, I'll pass it over to Amanda now. Thanks, Will. So I'm here to talk to you a little bit more about the overall MUPTI program. So MUPTI or the multi-unit property tax exemption is an incentive program to encourage high quality multi-unit downtown housing. The 10 year property tax exemption is enabled by state law and applies to new housing of more than five units. Student housing and housing used for transient or vacation use is ineligible. The property tax exemption is on qualified investments that are approved by council within a specific area. Currently, that area is generally the downtown plan boundary, which is shown here. As you'll recall, in 2015, after a two and a half year review, Council extensively revised the MUPTI program. Attachment B provides a summary of these revisions, which include several programmatic changes, such as making student housing ineligible, expansion of opportunities for neighborhood involvement, and bringing in third party reviews with a financial consultant and a community member panel. In addition, Council added several new criteria that projects must meet to be eligible for a MUPTI, including increased energy efficiency, higher quality design a moderate income housing contribution, and creation of a local economic impact plan. Council also created a volume cap and updated the boundary. And I'll touch on a couple of these items in a little bit more detail. First, the 2015 update created a volume cap based on the program goal of assisting in the creation of 1,500 new multifamily housing units. Once that cap is reached, Council will conduct a comprehensive review of the program to de determine if continuation is needed. As of today, there's been 177 MEPTI units created since 2015. If Council were to approve the three projects being presented today, that would result in the creation of 381 new units, bringing the total to 558, or about 37% of the volume cap. As I mentioned, Council added two third-party reviews of MUPTI applications. First, the MUPTI review panel is made up of technical and neighborhood representatives. The panel is tasked with reviewing applications, monitoring compliance with MUPTI requirements after approval, and annually reviewing the overall program. The review panel is working on finalizing the recommendation for today's projects, which will be provided to you for the March 9th meeting. Council also added an independent financial consultant who reviews all financials provided in the MUPTI application. The consultant's review is provided in attachment G and Anne will discuss it later in this presentation. I'll remind you of the steps that happen before a MUPTI application reaches council. First, applicants are required to attend a neighborhood association meeting to solicit feedback. There's a 30 day common period for the public to provide feedback on the application. The financial consultant completes their review of the application and the review panel conducts their evaluation and provides their conclusions to the city manager. Finally, these are the seven public benefits that projects must meet in order to be eligible for a MUPD. Council established these public benefits in 2015 in order to create some certainty about what the requirements are. The review panel and the city manager evaluate MUPTI applications based on these criteria. The recommendations will be detailed in the materials for your March 9th work session. And I'll remind you that projects must meet all seven of these public benefits in order for council to approve a MUPTI. I'll now hand it off to Dylan, who will briefly summarize the three projects you're considering today and how they propose they'll comply with each of the public benefit requirements. Good evening, councilors. <clears throat> uh, it's my great pleasure to be presenting to you for the first time, um, especially because the topic is this trio of really fascinating applications that mark um, a really important milestone in private investment on the riverfront. So from here, we're gonna launch into an overview of the three projects included in the MUPTI applications. 
Um, Atkins Dame has proposed four residential buildings that have a lot in common. Uh, they're all four-story structures with plenty of residential units. Um, unlike some past MUPTI applications, there's no commercial component. Uh, they share an overall aesthetic that seeks to bring downtown Eugene to the river. Parcel 3BC is toward the northwest corner of the riverfront near the Market District along the newly developed continuation of Fifth Avenue, as Will mentioned. On the other side of the Ferry Street Bridge, you have parcels 7 and 9, which both look out over the future riverfront plaza and the Willamette River itself. Parcels 3BC and 7 were sold to the developer in 2021, and parcel 9 is under agreement for sale. You might have noticed that the applications in your packets include references to scenario A's and scenario B's. Um, each of these MUPTI applications originally included two distinct development scenarios, and we told the developer that we could find a way to accommodate these either or sorts of development options. That point is moot um, at this time uh, because the applicant has withdrawn the higher density scenario B's from their proposals. Uh, the materials in your packet were edited to remove references to those higher density scenarios, and any remaining information about them can safely be ignored. Atkins Dame would like to break ground on parcels 3BC and 7 in the near future. As they get close to applying for building permits, they've opted to narrow things down to the scenario A development strategies for those parcels sooner rather than later. Um, Project 9, um, while they've still withdrawn scenario B for now, um, if the development market changes, they still have time to potentially revisit the opportunity to, for high density options, and we encourage them to do so. Starting with parcel 3BC and the pro project there, um, it's a proposal for a $58.6 million project with 174,000 square feet of residential only floor space. That includes 130 residential units uh, with studios and units with one, two, and three bedrooms. Um, design has always been one of the central concerns of the MUPTI approval criteria with added emphasis um, since the 2015 program changes. Um, like the other two proposals, the design for the building on parcel 3BC was reviewed by the city's urban design team. Their recommendations were overall positive, um, and the details of those reviews are part of the city manager's recommendation, which will be included in the materials for the next work session. All three projects provide parking for themselves. Um, on parcel 3BC, uh, parking is provided in an enclosed ground floor garage, no, no parking visible from the, the streets. Um, some of parcel 3BC's more notable features include the second floor courtyards visible in the second image there. Uh, for parcel seven, that proposal consists of $42.9 million uh, project with 108,000 square feet of residential space. Um, this one has 95 residential units with studios through two bedroom units. Um, all three projects, uh, as you can see in their, their pretty dim of image here, um, uh, they all try to engage with the district's new streets and contribute to a vital atmosphere in the pedestrian realm. Wherever communal space, uh, communal interior spaces abut the street, you see things like storefront style windows, awnings, and other features that open up the buildings to passersby. And where residential units abut the street, you see balconies and patios to bring residents together with the public spaces. Notably, parcels 3BC and 7 each have units with stoops where residents can enter their units directly from the sidewalk. The city put a lot of effort into designing the riverfront streets to be active, welcoming spaces, and it's great to see these buildings taking advantage of that. Like the other projects, the design details and the elevations that were submitted with the applications will be part of the MUPTI approval resolutions, and the developer will be held to those plans for their final designs. Uh, the urban design team's review of parcel seven resulted in several changes to the exterior presentation of the building. It was the, the one project that got some, some go backs, um, specifically on the facade that faces the Ferry Street Bridge and all the people who get stuck in rush hour traffic who will be looking out over that new district. Um, the changes there were minor, but they, they're also included in the, the packets for the next meeting. Parcel 7 has two sides with major exposure to the Riverfront District's new streets and also prominent visibility from the Ferry Street Viaduct, as I mentioned. Here, the parking would be tucked under the bridge. Um, it's the only one of the three projects that has a visible surface level parking, and that's really to accommodate the fact that they've got this awkward space under the bridge. The project on parcel nine is a 58.8 million, 203,000 square foot residential building. It's the largest proposal with 156 units ranging from studios to three bedrooms. As you can see, all three projects share a similar aesthetic 
with similar exterior materials and architectural styling, uh, which is going for a cohesive but not overly rep repetitive presentation to the community. Uh, Parson Line has really notable frontage on several streets, as well as the new Riverfront Park and Plaza. Uh, like Parcel 3BC, parking here will be provided in an enclosed ground floor garage. So next we'll look at each of the seven public benefit criteria and what these three applications include to address them. Uh, the first approval criteria is compact urban development, which is key to implementing our downtown plan and helping to address our local housing needs. Um, typically, this criterion is based on minimum residential unit density from zoning. Uh, but in this case, uh, the downtown riverfront special area doesn't have a min minimum residential density. Instead, the density requirements for these projects are established in the development agreement with Atkins Dame based on the terms approved by council. So the proposed units, the minimum and maximum units listed in the development agreement are shown on the slide here. Um, all three projects fit inside the required range. Public benefit criteria number two is green building features. Uh, these three projects plan to use the building and permit services pathway to achieve the Mupti green building requirements um, of having energy efficiency. They need to have an energy efficiency standard of 10% better than what's required by baseline building codes. Um, they must also provide conduit for electrical vehicle charging stations. In order to meet this public benefit requirement, the developer would be required to submit documentation of their compliance both before and after construction. In addition to the MUPTE BPS pathway that they're using to meet this criterion, they're also separately pursuing Earth Advantage Gold certification and Fit Well certifications. Uh, the Earth Advantage Gold is based on sustainable construction methods, and the Fit Well, Fit well certification highlights how they're leaning hard into the proximity of downtown and the recreational amenities along the river to encourage active transportation, access to transit, and outdoor activities for the residents. The program goal for local economic impact plans is that more than half of the professional services and construction contract dollars stay local to Lane County. Uh, the developer has submitted plans to address these criteria for all three riverfront projects. Uh, they anticipate that over half of the construction dollars will be spent locally. Essex Construction, a local company, is the general contractor for all three. Uh, to meet this criteria, they also must comply with wage, tax, and licensing laws and utilize avenues to promote opportunities for minority women and emerging small business enterprises. The fourth MUPTE public benefit criterion is a moderate income housing contribution. Um, this can be met by either paying a fee uh, to be dedicated to moderate income housing projects in the city or by including units with rents priced to be affordable for moderate income residents. Uh, per the approved terms on the development agreement, the applicant will pay the fee uh, for all three projects to meet this criteria. Uh, the project will pay 10% of the total exemption amount over the 10 year period. Um, the estimated payments for that, th these projects is shown in the table on the slide. Um, they intend to pay this fee in years three through 10 of the exemption uh, per the program's requirements. Uh, public cr benefit criteria number five is project design and compatibility, which encompasses uh, the broad areas listed on this slide. Uh, the design and compatibility aspects of the projects were reviewed by PDD's urban design team and the MUPTE review panel. Uh, the applicants submitted plans to address these criteria and uh, as, well, as well as the slew of design details that were um, sort of summarized in the slides earlier. Historic and existing housing sensitivity, which is approval criteria six, uh, was reviewed by the planning division's historic resource specialist. The review letters uh, from the specialist are included in the applications, um, and the specialist found that none of the projects would adversely impact a historic locale and that no existing housing was removed in the two years prior to the application date. Um, for the final MUPTE criterion, I'm going to hand it over to Anne to discuss the project need. Uh, let's see, the final project public benefit criteria is project financial need. The purpose of this criteria is to demonstrate that this project would not be financially feasible without the MUPTI. To determine the financial need, the MUPTI application process requires that applicants submit information about their expected costs and revenues and financial return for a proposed project. 
the applicants have to submit a 10-year pro forma analysis, which is a spreadsheet model that estimates costs and revenues over a set period of time. It includes variables about land costs and construction costs and expected rents and operating costs. A pro forma is a tool that helps the developer, the lender, and potential investors understand how costs and revenues flow over time and to estimate if it makes financial sense to invest in this project or some other investment that would give a better return. The Atkins Dame team submitted pro formas and documentation about their assumptions for each of the three proposed projects. Their applications include pro formas for each project with and without a MUPTI. This information has been through three different reviews before this city council's review. It's been reviewed by staff, an independent financial consultant, and the MUPTI review panel. We hired an independent financial consultant to review the pro forma and its assumptions. We hired PNW Economics, which is a real estate consulting firm based in the Portland area. The principal of the firm, Bill Reed, conducted the review. Mr. Reed has over 20 years of experience in this field. He's worked for both the private and public sectors across the Pacific Northwest on development pro on redevelopment projects. And he also teaches real estate market analysis at Portland State University. Uh, PNW Economics provided a written summary of its review of the three applications. And Mr. Reed, Mr. Reed came to a review panel meeting and answered questions from the panel. The PNW economics analyses are in your packet in attachment G. There will be a separate memo that formally summarizes the review panel's conclusions in your packet for the March 9 meeting. The financial consultant reviewed the key assumptions in the pro forma. Some of the most important are costs of construction and expected rents. The consultant found that the estimated construction costs are generally consistent with current market conditions. He found the cost for one project to be slightly higher than current conditions, one project to be slightly lower, and the third to be in the middle. The consultant also found the rents to be higher than what comparable apartments are charging in today's market. He ran an independent pro forma analysis three independent pro forma analyses and adjusted some of the key variables to align with what he found in the Eugene market. For example, he used lower rents than what Atkins Dame used. Based on its independent analysis, PNW Economics concluded that all three projects would not be financially feasible without a MUPTI. The review panel also concluded that the three applications met this criteria for, for project need. I think it's important to recognize that the MUPTI applications were submitted to the city last October. It's likely that their estimates of construction costs may be too low. Inflation has affected the cost of many things and construction materials are not immune. There's a good chance that these projects will experience higher construction costs than what is shown in these applications. The financial consultant noted that if Atkins Dame's assumptions about construction costs and rents are too optimistic, the project's financial return will be lower than what's shown in the MUPTI applications. All of these three projects are challenging development projects under any circumstances, much less inflation that we're experiencing today. This site is a former brownfield, and there's a risk that Atkins Dame will find unexpected contamination. The city and EWEB and DEQ and Atkins Dame have all worked to minimize that risk, but there's still a small risk. Most of the risk associated with this project, that unknown risk, will add cost to development, making it, hard for it harder for it to be financially feasible. The three proposed projects meet the criteria for need under the fairly optimistic scenarios that are described in their applications. As you know, the MUTTI program is a tool to encourage the construction of housing in our downtown. It reduces operating costs for the first 10 years of operation, which makes it more likely to be financially feasible. And as you know, the MUPTI program exempts property taxes on taxable value for up to 10 years, for on new taxable value up to 10 years. This chart shows estimated tax revenue for parcel 3BC. The solid light at the bottom is the tax revenue that Adkins Dame estimated the parcel will generate as is. They have purchased this parcel. It is now on the tax rules. They will pay this property tax, they will pay property taxes on this land, whether or not they build anything. The dashed line shows the estimated property taxes with the proposed building. There's no change in tax revenue in years one through 10, but it jumps in year 11. By year 20, par uh, parcel 3BC will generate about 1.2 million. This pattern is the same for parcel seven and parcel nine. And if you add up the new tax revenue from parcel 3BC seven and nine, 
In year 20, these proposed projects will generate about $3.3 million in tax revenue. If the projects aren't built, the land aren't built, the land from these parcels will generate about $127,000 in year 20. The tax revenue from the proposed residential structures will increase tax revenue by about $3.2 million by in year 20. I'm going to now hand it back over to hand the mic back over to Will. I will scramble to unmute myself. Before closing, we'd like to make the connection to the housing implementation pipeline, the HIP. This is a habit we're trying to cultivate for ourselves whenever possible. Starting on the right with market rate housing, the buildings in these MUPTI applications would provide 381 market rate housing units. In addition to the units they propose to build, there's also the benefit that comes from the moderate income housing contribution that Dylan talked about. As part of, um, the, we're currently in the process of using a similar contribution from a previous project, the Gordon Lofts, as part of a funding package for the moderate income housing at 1059 Willamette. The estimated $2 million that could come from these three projects could help a similar project or projects come out of the ground. And then finally, it has been very clear in past council direction that the adjacent affordable housing on parcel two is an integral part of this redevelopment vision. And so I've noted it here. Next slide, please. So we've called this work session information only, but there's sure been a lot of it. Hopefully all of this information helps make these applications a little easier to understand. And hopefully we also didn't bury the lead too deep that this is an important milestone in moving this whole vision forward, uh, one that you've all been working on for a very long time. We'll ret to return on March 9th with the city manager's recommendation, the MUPTI panel's finalized conclusions, and an opportunity for your deliberation and possible action. For the rest of the time now, we'd like to hear your questions. We'll answer what we're able to and return with more information in March. Thank you. Thank you very much, all of you, for that presentation. It was very clear. And I actually have to say that I thought the council packet was very clear. So I really appreciate the effort that you went into making this understandable for us. And I thought the charts were very helpful and really appreciated this uh, presentation. So. Um, it's the kind of thing that we need to hear multiple times. So um, I'm grateful every time we get to repeat it, it it's helpful. Uh, all right, looks like we have Alan and then Mike. Thanks, Mayor. Um, yeah, I reiterate the packet was uh, really good and, and uh, very helpful and very clear. Um, <clears throat> my interest in MUPTI these days is understanding the, the MUPTI reforms in the context of this application. We spent a lot of time and effort building those criteria. And um, the reform to me was really about two things. One, making sure that we did get public benefits out of this because we are giving away tax revenue uh, uh, from the project. And then also having some, doing a deep dive in the economics. It was quite controversial. It is controversial whether or not they're needed. You know, for example, uh, some of the big towers that are in Franklin, one, they're blocks away, almost identical buildings. One had a MUPTI, one didn't. It was kind of uh, arguable that the one that got the MUPTI didn't need it. One block and a half away did the same thing and didn't need it. Uh, so uh, adding that independent analysis and having that transparent pro forma are really important. So the public benefits that I'm interested in looking at uh, from the reform and the ones I helped uh, get in there, lessons learned from the capstone project, as I call them, uh, making sure there's no student housing. Uh, I wanted to make sure that there was a 10% increase in energy efficiency, uh, that 10% of it went towards affordable housing fund, 10% uh, of the benefit, um, that the local, that there were local jobs, that's a public benefit, and minority and women owned businesses is a public benefit. Having these projects be EV ready and and then making sure that they abided by the local wage laws. So I have a couple of questions that I asked. I, I provided them earlier. So on, on page 62 of our packet, it talks about project returns and performance for 3B, but it's the same for all three projects proposals. Uh, to me, it's really the essence of, of whether an MUPTI makes project sense and makes it doable. Um, Oh, can you explain what the return rates are for a normal project and what's expected and how does, uh, um, and, and what this one does with and without MUPTI? Because I think that's really important. 
Will, do you want me to take that? Okay. Uh, the ex normal returns change over time, depending on all kind, whatever else is happening in the investment world. And if so, stock market's doing well, real, real estate development's going to have to offer a higher return to attract those equity investors. Right now, what we've heard from local developers and from the financial consultant, you need to see about 6% return on the cash, the equity investment by roughly year three to attract that kind of equity investment. And that can go up or down as, as markets shift, but that's what folks are seeing right now. Does that answer your question enough, Councillor Zelenka? I feel like it had more yeah. parts to it. Yeah, well, there's a lot to it. But, um, and, and if you go look at the pro forma with and without Mupti, without it, it's like 0.06% to 4% and with it, it's 3.7 to 7.4% over the 10 year period. So that makes it uh, doable in the, you have to be able to track capital to do these because this is, you know, 100, and, 100 million, what is it? 100 million plus in uh, uh, investment. So, um, and, and, and maybe you can just briefly touch on the equity. This is like 36% equity. How does that play into this calculation? On the, on the, that, um, it plays into it in a variety of ways. Mostly what you, the equity acts in the same way as if you were purchasing a single family home and you, and in the olden days, the banks wanted you to put 20% down. That numbers really come down in the single family market. In this market, it, it ebbs and flows as lenders ebb, you know, have changes in their willing, their ability to accept risk. Right now, what we're seeing is sick. They want to see they're willing to lend 60 to 65% of the cost. And but the other piece of the calculation is the development has to have enough revenue to cover the debt service. And so you need, they want to see a cushion generally of if, if the debt service every year is $100,000, the banker wants to see at least $125,000 of income before you pay down that debt. They want a cushion to make sure they're going to get paid. And so not only is that loan to cost ratio important, the debt coverage ratio is important, but then that's all well and good if you can meet those criteria for your lender. If you don't have, if that equity equation, it's kind of, you know, this and that. If, if you can't give enough return to the equity investor, you're going to have to change that ratio of debt to equity to make sure you meet the equity investor's requirements as well. So it's it's all sort of one of these things you push here and it pushes out here. And But generally, it's rough. Right now, what we're seeing is 60 to 65 percent debt. Right. And so, yeah, the rate of return is 6 percent and, and debt service covered ratio, very, very common utilities, 125 percent all the time. So that's that's very understandable. Thanks. That's very helpful. I'll need another round, Mary. Okay, uh, Mike and then Claire. Thank you, Mayor. I, I'm happy that we have this time lag between this initial opportunity to talk about some of the features of this and then the, the formal presentation on the 9th because it gives staff an opportunity to come back with some further information I'm hoping that they will be able to do. Um, in order to, to have a good conversation with the community about the value of doing this, one of the things I'm hoping you will <coughs> assemble is the information on uh, the time frame where we did student housing with MUPTIs that, uh, I don't know, some folks were, were less than pleased about. And I'm saying that tongue in cheek for my friend, Alan. Um, I'd like to know the amount with all properties that took advantage of a MUPTI within the student housing districts, university district, what the taxes were that those properties paid before the project. And now that we've seen those MUPTI periods pass, what are they paying today? And when all of them complete the MUPTI periods, what will be the difference between the taxes those properties combined total paid before the MUPTI and now after those projects have been complete. Does Denny, I see you looking, you understand what I'm asking for? Yeah, we do, Councillor Clark. Um, there's been, 
you know, I don't know how many student housing projects receive the monthly. We'd have to circle back, but if it's a half dozen of them, we can do that for you. The other question is, you know, what is considered student housing and not student housing? Because there's been apartments that have been built out in the kind of West Eugene University. Well, let me make it clear then about what my request is. It's for those who took advantage of MUFTI, the definition of student housing or not is less important. Okay. okay. And, and we can just focus on the West University area because that's where, where the MUFTI boundary extended historically, yeah. not anymore, um, and capture some of those projects for sure. We can do that. I suspect it will show that today we're receiving millions and millions more than we would have if those projects had not been built as a city. Um, secondarily, uh, we saw a presentation as a council, I don't know when, probably four or five years ago, I'm, it may have been longer than that, I need to be corrected. <clears throat> Renee Gruby gave us a presentation about the impact, the economic impact of the arts on our community, and it's significant. Um, she put together with her staff a complete representation of all the ways the arts represent our, our, our impact our local economy from one end to the other of all types of art. And the number that was presented to council was that the arts in Lane County as a whole, and not just Eugene, have a $45.2 million impact on our local economy, which is huge. Could you remind me again of the project total for all three, four of these and what the impact will be on our economy? What's that number? So one's a 45 million, one's a 50 million. What's the combined total of all of them, please? Dylan, do you have that at your fingertips? I don't have the slide pulled up. It's about 150 million, I think. For the That's kind of was my math too. So roughly this has three times, just this one set of projects has three times the impact on our local economy as does the arts as a whole to the entire county. That's the scale of this project and the importance of it and the impact that it's going to have built out. So I, I hope we can move forward with this. I may need a second round as well, Mayor, for a couple other people. Thank you. It's 160.3 million, Mike. Thank you. Uh, we, Claire and then Randy. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, I'll need a second round for sure. So I just want to preface my comments and questions by saying I've been a big fan of the riverfront development and wanting us to invest in this. Um, I believe I voted yes on every Mufti application that's come before us. But I also think we need to really ask some tough questions and scrutinize these applications thoroughly. And I have to say, Will, I think you totally buried the lead and it kind of bugs me when we're considering a huge tax exemption of this nature. Where's the slide that says, what is the total deferred taxes on this project? And I don't see it in my packet. We will put that together. Probably yeah, that's can. a big missing item for me. I'm sorry, you know, you're trying to make me do math and I don't appreciate it. Um, so yeah, we need to know how, I mean, I think, you know, there's a good chance we'll agree that it's a, a good investment, but we need to know what is the estimated tax we're going to be deferring with, if we approve these three MUPTIs. Um, so some of my kind of harder questions are, you know, the rationale for the MUPTI is originally was you know focusing on downtown because typically downtown is a challenging place to do this kind of development uh lots uh have to be uh buildings have to be torn down working in the cramped space and all the contingencies that you have to deal with for traffic and impact on other residents etc cetera, etc cetera. um what are some of the barriers to development of these lots or things that make it more difficult to build here than in other places. And, and before you respond, I mean, I see lots that have been cleared, so there's no demolition required. I see lots that are prime real estate on the riverfront. Um, there's no immediate neighbors that they're going to have to worry about impacting. 
like right across the street. So give me some justification for why these lots are, you gave a, a few in, in your comments, Anne, but why these lots are more challenging to develop than a lot somewhere else in the city. I'll maybe we'll I'll take a first shot at that because I've been thinking about that a lot. Um, I think there's several things, Councillor Surratt. This that's a really good question because you do see housing build in other parts of the city that don't get a tax exemption. Um, a few things, um, you know, that were mentioned is this is this is a brownfield site, and that is unlike you know some other property in a part of town that's a greenfield, and and um, you see infrastructure there now, but. Um, it took a lot to get this project where it is now to build the roads to clear the sites there was demo involved of the e web uh, properties and so forth so it did require some site clearing as well and who paid for that say that again who paid for the demolition those are built into the purchase price so the other thing that i was going to mention is they're paying market value for this property and the market value reflects the cost for us to build the infrastructure and that all in, that included demo and everything. And okay. so then that's different than a lot of projects that we've um, seen downtown. The LCC building, if you recall, we're selling for a dollar. We've sold, you know, the Tate property under value, under market value, and uh, many other properties downtown we've sold for under market value as, as a stimulus to help those projects move forward. Um, I would say that the construction method, the quality of the materials, using brick and bedding, the parking, those are all different than what you've seen, what you see getting built out in the community. A lot of wood kind of structures are, that don't have a long lifespan. Um, this is a prevailing wage project, which is unlike any other private development that's being built right now, is this project is going to pay prevailing wage, which adds cost to that project as well. Um, there's an absorption rate here that's pretty risky because they're building a lot of units at once. And so they have to take the risk of absorbing all of those units that they're building. So they're bringing 300 and something units on at once. So there's some risk there. So all those things together make this project pretty unique. Uh, it's more challenging than the typical project you'd see on a greenfield being built somewhere. It has a lot of challenges. And those, those add up to be dollars in the end. So it, it, it is, it, there is a risk factor here that's real. Okay, I appreciate that response. That was that was very thorough. Can uh, I'm gonna toss I, in a couple others. Working around the viaduct is a is a particularly interesting challenge, and they're also working to be flexible around the Oregon 2022 festival. That that is, it's a challenge for the festival. It's a challenge for the developers to work together in the same site. That that uh, is, they're working with us to be flexible, in, but we have created a challenge for them. Okay. Um, on design compatibility, uh, one of our requirements is to harmonize with adjacent development. And um, I have to say, unless they were kind of swayed by the Yapuya Terrace uh, architecture, I'm not feeling that their architecture is compatible with being adjacent to our historic Ferry Street neighborhood. Um, and I think it's the parcel nine in particular that quite frankly looks like a building that the U of O campus would build as, or an office tower. It does not look like uh, an inviting housing unit. So I don't typically comment on the designs of our MUPD applicants, but I'm not loving these and I'll take a second round, thanks. Okay, thank you, Randy and then Matt. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, uh, Will, Amanda, and Anne for the presentation. I thought it was uh, very clear. And I also, uh, like Alan, appreciated the packet. And then Denny and Anne, I wanted to thank you for following up to Claire's questions. I think um, it's important that we understand those points and that the public hears these points. Um, for me, this is an important project. This is, uh, we've talked for years of trying to connect downtown to the river. And this, this is, really the mechanism that's that's going to do that. Um, really, my only disappointment, and I certainly understand why, but my only disappointment is the, the density has been reduced. Um, but I also understand building materials are um, at an all-time high, and there's problems in the labor market. 
in getting enough enough workers. Although the fact that it's a prevailing wage hopefully will, will help ensure that we get an adequate and skilled workforce on site that can deliver um, on time and at or under budget. But I, that's that's yet to be seen, of course. I guess my, my question is, is there any way to incent or work with the developers to try to gain back some of what has been shaved off the project? And I'm saying that from the standpoint, I mean, I, I see this as a hundred year project, a hundred year lifespan um, with this project, the way it's being constructed. And it, it just seems like it would be a missed opportunity to not gain every square foot of space that we can um, when we're trying to keep our urban growth boundary in check and we have a dearth of housing. Um, I'll, let me, I'll take a first shot, Will, and you can add. Um, one of the things I've learned working with Atkins and Dame is they share the goal of trying to make this, you know, the best project we can bring forward, the most dense project we can bring forward. And, you know, if, if everything were equal, they would definitely be favoring the more dense project. The hard thing is to have it make it, to make it work financially um, has been challenging. And it's one of the reasons that they've started on 3BC and 7 in particular, because those don't necessarily, because of their location next to the viaduct, they don't really beg for a lot of density. So they're holding out to hope to do more density on parcel 3A because it's right there across street from the Fifth Street Market area. For parcel 10, it's by the steam plant, it's on the park. So one of the reasons for starting where they're starting um, is to create the opportunity for more density as maybe conditions favor as we go down the road. So um, we share that. Um, I don't think four-story buildings in these particular locations are necessarily about a bad outcome, but we do need more housing. So it'd be nice for us to get more units as well. Thank you. That's about what I thought you would say. I, I just wish there I wish there was a way to to make this happen, but I, I, I don't doubt that the developers have kind of run into a wall here. Um, my last question, I know there's been some construction in our downtown that has been accomplished high density uh, without Mupti, but how, how many projects? I'm aware of the one um, that Alan was referencing earlier, but what, what else has been constructed without Mupti that would be comparable? We don't have anything comparable that's been built in the um, downtown plan area without a MUPTI. I, I think the closest projects that have been uh, built besides the student housing projects uh, on the east side of downtown would be the Midtown Arts Center. Um, and then farther south, you have um, uh, the um, the Amazon uh, Amazon Corner building. North, you have uh, the, was it the one on Club. Um, uh, that's southwest of Oakway. So, uh, and then some more development over north of Alton Baker Park. So I'd say those are the ones, but there's nothing, um, nothing quite in the, the core area of downtown. The core area is what I'm, I'm most interested in because I think it most closely reflects what we have in the riverfront um, development area. Is that a correct assumption? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I think that's all I have for now. I may come back with a second round after I hear some more. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Matt, and then Jennifer. Thank you, Mayor, and I share my counselors, um, my colleagues' um, appreciation for the presentation. Uh, and I want to put put it out there that I'm enthusiastic about cranes in the air and 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 building more housing in our, our community. Uh, but I have some concerns uh, and questions. Uh, I, I appreciate Councillor Syrett focusing in on the, the quantitative. I'm going to ask uh, some qualitative questions, but first, um, when was the last time that the, um, the, the, the MUPTI abatement program was revised by Council? The last time the program was revised by Council was 2015. Okay, that, that's helpful. I, uh, in the qualitative realm, I'm reading a lot about health and community and equity and happiness and the project compass on one of the, um, one of our, our slides in our packet, um, 
uh, references the aforementioned, uh, I guess, subjective pieces, but I can't find anything about reference to uh, pet friendly units. I can't find in Oregon, there are 59% uh, of, of our population are pet owners. Uh, and I can't locate anything in reference to um, building ADA units, American Dis uh, Disability Act uh, accessible units above and beyond the state or federal minimums. And I'm honing in on this because um, I believe it was in our green building features narrative, um, parcel seven in particular uh, prides itself on quote, going above and beyond the minimum MUPTI standards. How equitable is it if, if we're supporting with public tax dollars an abatement program, uh, if, if there's the, a minimum amount of ADA accessible units that are limited to the first floor, uh, is there any comment on the amount of ADA units available? Uh, is there any where in this packet that I'm missing the piece about health and community in regards to pet ownership and promoting uh, 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 the ability for families to move in or individuals with pets at these uh, riverfront um, units. Uh, Councilor Keating, those are uh, good questions. Um, I know that the reason, part of the reason why it's not explicit in the materials provided is because it's not an explicit part of the, the current MUPTI criteria. However, um, you're asking really good questions. And so it's the kind of thing that we'll follow up with the development team and find out uh, what their what their thoughts are on these, what uh, steps they've taken, and, and we can come back with more information on that for you. Thank you, Will. Okay, Jennifer, and then Naya tells me Greg has his hand raised. I'm not seeing him, but um, Jennifer, take it away. Yeah, thank you. Actually, thanks to several colleagues, I think, Almost all of my questions have already been answered, which is great. I really am thankful for the presentation today. And I also am very thankful that we divided it up. I think that was a smart move and I, and I appreciate that. So my only question that is left, um, I think I already asked this before the last time we did this and I just can't remember is, what does it mean when we're um, open that the minority and women and small emerging businesses have to have open competitive opportunities. What does that mean? Amanda, do you know how that's specifically applied to this? Yeah, so the MUPTI program requires that uh, they, they have a consultation with city staff and our contracting staff who are specialized in um, providing opportunities for minority women business enterprises and uh, we meet with uh, the developer and their contractor to talk about all of the ways that they can reach out to these to these businesses um, and make sure that they have um, equitable opportunities to bid for the project. And and we have done that or are going to do that or we haven't done it with this project yet. We've done it for past MUPTI projects that have that have been approved, um, and we found that most contractors, uh, local contract contractors, already know about a lot of those opportunities and are actively utilizing them. Do we know if there's any positive outcomes from these consultations? Like, do they end up hiring minority women or emerging small businesses? We have the list of contractors that, um, that each of the projects have used. Um, we can certainly look at those and see which of those, what, what, the, what those firms look like. Um, right now, I don't have them. I wouldn't need that for this. Obviously, I'm just like, if we have a conversation about Mupti in general, I just love to know if this is working and we should keep doing it or if it needs to, like it's just words on the page and it's not actually getting us anything. Um, other than that, uh, Claire and Randy asked my question. So I will, I am done. Okay, thank you. So I am understanding that Greg has joined us and that Naya is going to transfer him to panelists. He's stuck in attendee world. So Naya, turn it over to you. Yeah, I'm in the twilight oh, zone. There you go. I've been oh, here, welcome. <laughs> I've been here for a while, but I, I you can't see me. Uh, I, just to follow up on Jennifer's uh, question and comment, can we get some data on uh, what 
has been done since uh, I believe this goes back to when John Reese was city manager. And uh, this is one of the issues that I brought up with him about uh, minority contracting and particularly the utilization of subcontractors, uh, MBE, DBE, EBE, uh, WBE contractors in, um, in, in city projects and city work. And uh, I don't think that we have had a report in a while about uh, that level of utilization. I don't recall it. Um, I may have it somewhere, but um, I think it would be a good time for us to update that. And also to reinforce the fact that we wanna make sure that um, we have more than just names on streets in this development, that we actually have people who uh, do this kind of work, uh, you know, they do, you know, sheetrock and everything else, electrical, um, that have an opportunity to um, bid on the project, uh, do some subcontracting work, and actually put money back into communities of color and other um, uh, disadvantaged and uh, underrepresented communities in the business communities because I hear about this all the time. Okay, thank you. Uh, a lineup of second rounds. Uh, Al Alan, did you want a second round? Okay, Alan and then Mike and then Claire and then Matt. Thanks, Mayor. Um, so uh, Mike, the issue isn't whether or not we did get tax revenue later after the MUPTI expired. The issue was whether or not we needed to grant them a tax exemption and get the project built. The projects I was talking about, two blocks away, almost identical buildings, and yet one, it didn't seem like we needed to. And that was probably true for a lot of MUPTI projects. Um, I'm not sure that that's true for this one, though. Um, Claire, the, I did that math for you uh, on how much tax exemption it is. Over, over 10 years, it's... Um, $20.7 million, um, 7.6 for the first one and 5.5 .5 for the next one and 7.6. It ranges from like, starts at 1.8 million and goes to 2.4 million on an annual basis. So 20, almost $21 million. Um, the questions I had uh, related to uh, ensuring that we get the public benefits. Um, how do we ensure that the project actually does use 55% local firms, and, like they said in their application, and that minority women uh, owned businesses are actually used. How do we ensure that? Amanda, do you want to take the questions about the compliance with the program? Yeah, so um, I'll clarify what the program requirements are. Right now, it just requires that applicants have to provide a plan to use local firms, which is what these applicants have done. Uh, the city is unable to require that developers use specific firms, but the plan demonstrates their intention to use local firms. Um, and Atkins Dame has indicated to us that they are committed to keeping the dollars as local as much as possible. Um, and until the project goes out to bid, we don't know what the specific contractors uh, will be chosen for the construction. So we don't go back and look. We get, um, once a project is completed, we get a list of all of the contractors who performed on the project. So for like the projects we've done, we have that list for Ferry Street Manor and for Gordon Loft. So we will get that for these projects after the fact. And we, oh, also, yeah. get, we also get a list of all of the zip codes of um, all workers who are on the projects um, and have those also. Cool, that's a good look back. What happens if they end up with 40%? Uh, they well, the requirement was to submit a plan, um, and so I they I think try their best to use that plan. But as you know, there's lots of factors that go into these projects, and so um, it's hard to know. So no necessarily ramifications. How do we uh, also ensure that they have compliance with local wage laws like prevailing wage, Davis Bacon? Yeah, so the MUPTI program requires that the developer, their contractor, and all their subcontractors submit a notarized affidavit saying that they will follow wage, tax, and license, licensing laws. Um, those affidavits are reviewed by the review panel, um, which does have a union and trades representative who kind of tracks a lot of these firms and has raised red flags before. Um, and so should we find that any of these entities, including subcontractors, aren't in compliance, they would risk their MUPTI 
the city could terminate the mafi, um, impose certain penalties beyond any sanctions they would have for just general non-compliance with the law. So that's that's how that, that requirement is fulfilled. Right, because that was an issue with capstone, one of the capstone lessons learned. Um, how do we ensure that the green building benefits, in particular the 10% above energy code and sustainability features are captured? Yeah, so this information is vetted during the building permit review process. So they use, um, when they submit for building permits, they also submit a standard energy, energy model, which shows that the building is expected to perform 10% or better, uh, better than 10% above code. Um, and then after the MUPTI project is completed, they then submit a commissioning report showing that the building is, was built according to the energy model that showed that building performance. Um, and then council also added a provision that projects are required to submit energy usage data during the course of the exemption. Um, it's collected so that we can evaluate the MUPTI program in the future. We have with the, the two recent buildings, only about a year's worth of data. So we haven't figured out what to do with it, but that is on the list for our panel to think about um, in this coming year about how that data can be used and reviewed. Um, the, uh, one of the things that I got into the MUPTI reform was the 10% of the exempt tax exemption benefits go to affordable housing fund. Um, and um, I don't think that anybody actually has taken up option B, which is to build 30% market-based housing. Has anybody done that? Ferry, Ferry Street Manor did. They included um, units in their project. So that was a 50 unit building and at least 15 of the units have uh, moderate income rents. All right. Um, so how do we ensure that they make those payments since they're proposing to make them in starting in year three through 10? Um, how, do, how do we, how, do, how does that work? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so like other Let me ask right all the questions related to this. Okay. Is there a way to speed up those payments? So we're gonna get years three through 10. That's kind of way out there. They're kind of spread out all over the place. The total is 2.1 million. So that reduces the property tax exemption to 18.6 million. But we, so how do we, does it have to be paid out over 10 years? Can we get a net present value lump sum up front? Um, and like, how did we get 400K from the Gordon loss? Did they just do that that way? So choice yes. or? So the, the MUPTI program, when council added this um, public benefit, they provided two options um, that an applicant can either choose to pay the full fee in year one and they would get a 5% discount or they could choose to pay it annually over years three through 10. So that's how um, Atkins Dame is uh, choosing to pay the fee. Um, and in terms of making sure they make that payment, so like other criteria, um, it involves the developer's commitment to take certain actions in the future. And we do monitor that through the life of the MUPTI approval period. And so um, our MUPTI review panel evaluates all MUPTI programs on an annual basis to ensure compliance. And this is one of the elements. If they, they risk losing the exemption, if they don't follow, follow through, meaning they would need to pay the tax exemption back. Um, and so, uh, yeah, hopefully that answers your question about that. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, are the new setback requirements going to be applied here for commercial development? That would be a will and daddy question. <laughs> I, I'm not sure the specifics of the um, where the new setbacks apply. I know that this area is covered by the downtown riverfront zone, which is a special district. And so my understanding is that um, that all of the zoning in, in this area, it, it's it's very carefully prescribed uh, through the, the plan that was developed, which has really um, been an implementation, uh, an implementation tool of the master plan that was developed by EWEB. And so, um, so this is one of the places where you have a very specific vision with a very explicit code uh, intended to implement that vision. My understanding is the setback was citywide though, Danny, right? Uh, that's correct. We should circle, we'll circle back with that. I think that's a really good question. Um, and other times where we've done citywide kind of code amendments, these special areas that have been very carefully planned and codified. So this is a, as Will mentioned, a master plan development area where we've given consideration already to height and setbacks and all that. So a lot of cases we pull those out and don't have them necessary, but I have to circle back whether or not those apply or not. But that's a really good question. We can right because you know we're trying to ensure 
project design and compatibility, but we don't have design review. So how does that work? Thanks, Mayor. Okay, thank you, uh, Mike, and then Claire. Thank you, Mayor. I, I just want to say to my friend Alan that if nobody else does, I, I wanted to be I want to assure you that I remember how hard you fought for the clawback provisions on this seven years ago. So I, I'm I know you didn't get all the way to, to where you wanted to go and you reminded us today, but I <clears throat> I remember if nobody else does. Uh, to my friend Matt, I would say that seven years ago, this was the Muppy was ready to die. You know, there was so much opposition to it as a program. <clears throat> and George Brown and I sat down and went through the process of adding new things to this that would get it acceptable to enough people. And the chamber was ready to say, no, nah, we don't need the Mufti anymore. It's just too much of a fight and we can't get them done. And we rewrote that and then had amendments from several other counselors in the process here at the motions. But the workforce housing part was the part where we asked everybody to take a flyer on this and it did work and does work in the one place it's been tried. And we accepted the payoff as, a, as, a, as an alternative, as a way of getting all the votes necessary to get there. But I still maintain that having the developer um, build things that are affordable to people who are making the AMI, um, you know, average median income, was 30% of the units that they could afford was the wise way to move forward with this. The other community benefit provisions were also important to this being used as many times as it has and done so effectively. The panels put in in order to measure all of what was done was an, was an attempt at the clawback portions and works in much of uh, uh, the way that it was suggested. Um, but it was a way to get community buy-in to get it done in the first place. The, the interesting thing to me with this is that um, maybe maybe Will or, or uh, Ann or, or Denny can help me with this, but what was the complete dollars brought in by the CE last year? The total dollars brought in by the <clears throat> construction excise tax last year. I think we're probably this year we're looking at close to a million dollars, could be at eight hundred thousand or something. We've had a really robust construction year, so I think you know we adjusted the fee. If you remember, it started here and then it yeah. the second year. So I'm going to guess it's probably in the neighborhood of a million dollars a year. So this one set of projects is going to double what that program provides or better for just this one set of buildings. We'd have to check the math on that, but we can do that. I would suggest that the construction exercise tax has, has um, scared away more development of homes in a market that badly needs them than has uh, benefited us in the monies we've raised to build low income housing and that the Mukti and in this project particularly show the, the wisdom of incentivizing rather than penalizing as a way to get low-income housing built as a, as a general policy perspective. So I, I just needed to make those comments so that we're clear on it. Thank you. Okay. Oops, wrong one. Thank you. Uh, Claire and then Matt. Thank you, Mayor. So I will back up and say, I. Fully appreciate this work session. I appreciate the presentation. I think this was very wise of staff to organize this um, work session prior to us having to make any kind of decision. Um, so, you know, I said I, I don't love the designs. I, I think they're overly modern, I guess I would say. Um, so, uh, you know, the Gordon Lofts, I, you know, I think kind of struck a good balance between hearkening to the area and being a modern design. And I guess I would have liked to have seen something more along those lines. Um, I totally appreciate what uh, Councilor Groves was lamenting about the heights not being higher and missed opportunity for housing. However, 
I believe that they will be more compatible to creating a neighborhood feel in that area than doubling the heights there, um, which would feel like imposing high rise buildings that aren't welcoming to non residents, which is the feeling you get when you walk around some of those high rise neighborhoods in the Portland River front. Um, so it's a trade off and I recognize that. Um, so the independent analysis said they thought that William uh, Adkins Dane was planning to charge rents that are higher than is typical for this type of housing in Eugene. Is the developer concerned that this will make it more challenging to attract tenants? I followed up with the developer because to better understand their perspective. And they think that they're going to be able to get those rents. I think they're, they're assertive rents, but given the demand for rental housing is on the upswing and and it's only gotten more on the upswing since they submitted this in October. I think there is a there is a chance I'll be able to get those rents. I think it's um, it's it's a very good location. <laughs> it's, yes, it it's is. going to have it's going to have really lovely views that uh, and and I think there's um, I hear excitement from folks in the community. People who know I work at the city ask me, when is that going to come out of the ground? They, like there's interest in being in the location. And so that will, that will allow them, that will give them an opportunity to off, to, to attract, to attain a little bit higher rent. Yeah. Thank you. And, you know, we were talking about the master plan and this being master plan. Well, we've changed the master plan, right? Originally, I think parcel nine was going to be a hotel. And now they're plopping housing there. So the hotel's been like relegated to the background. The, the affordable housing's been relegated to the background. And, you know, that's going to be prime, prime real estate that they're building that all of these on, but that one in particular. Um, the requirement for electrical vehicle chargers, that's not part of the MUFTI requirements, or, is it? Mentioned Dylan, by can, Dylan. Dylan, can you speak to that? Uh, it, it is part of the requirements for the, the green building um, criterion. Oh. Um, they, they don't have to actually provide electric vehicle charging stations, but they have to at the least put the conduit there so that they can be installed. Yeah, I thought mm -hmm. that was state law now too. Yeah. Uh, I'm not, I'm not sure multi, on that one off the top Maybe of not for multifamily housing. Um, can we get more information about the Earth Advantage and Fitwell programs or whichever ones they choose to do? Um, yes. And that 2 million, I guess I would say about the 2 million, which is great, which would go to our Affordable Housing Trust Fund, but that's over a seven year period, right? It's not 2 million every year. Correct. Okay. Um, and lastly, I'll say, I think we did a great job in revamping this program when we did it seven years ago. And I think it would behoove us to have another work session just on the program itself, not having to do with this these MUPTI applications to see if we're happy with where things are or if there's other um, changes we would like to make to the program. So I might be putting a work session out on that. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Councilor Zelenka's inquiries uh, got me noodling about the need for guardrails. Councilor Clark called them clawback. Um, I, I guess clawback clauses. Um, there's really should be there's sh there should be some opportunity for council. Should the plan that's in front of us go sideways for, for whatever reason to hold those who submitted the plan? And I, I'm not accusing this particular applicant for not being a, 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 a good faith um, applicant, but it's disturbing to me that there are no uh, tools currently in our toolbox to hold folks accountable who apply and then don't deliver and i would hope i would think that with capstone on as part of 
recent memory in, in this community that uh, there would be a thirst to weave in those guardrails. And I would be supportive of not only um, partnering with Councilor Zelenka and, and seeing what he worked on when the Mupti was last re review, reviewed and revised, but if there's a, uh, a Mupti review committee, uh, I would hope that colleagues would, uh, would look at those quite seriously. Um, I look forward to the next work session, Mayor, and, and hopefully my previous inquiries are addressed uh, uh, when we next meet. Thank you. Oh, and Mayor, if I may ask a subjective question of the presenters, because Councillor Syret pointed out the, the aesthetics, and uh, I don't necessarily uh, think that, uh, well, I, I concur with her assessment. I don't necessarily think that the plans are... Uh, uh, aligned with the aesthetics of the neighborhood as it, as it alludes, as alluded to in, in the presentation. What's the most Eugene thing about this project? I, I'd be happy to answer that. I think that um, in my mind, uh, from a design perspective, which I guess is not quite what you asked, but I'd say from a design perspective, the most uh, Eugene thing that the development team did was they modified the master plan to um, realign the streets to extend the downtown block system into this site. Now you've got railroad tracks, you've got a river, you've got a viaduct, so things have to tweak and change, but they, they realigned a couple of the streets so that if you're walking from the west side of downtown or from the north through the East Kinderview neighborhood and you come into the site, you know, in two years, you'll be able to tell what's new and what's not, but you go out 40, 50 years from now and as you walk through the site, you won't be, it won't be clear to you where you hit, you know, the, the project, where you cross this imaginary line that we can see right, right now, um, because you'll still be walking and you'll still have a rhythm to your walk as you go from, you know, uh, Oak Street to Pearl Street to High Street to Mill Street to Ferry Street. And, and that rhythm will, will uh, set a tone for the entire way that the whole neighborhood feels. And then suddenly you'll find yourself at the park. And so I think that that, um, that very careful understanding of the way that downtown ticks, um, that recognition that, that that's, that's one uh, common factor, whether you're starting on the south side, going to the north side, kind of through this whole area, that there's this, this rhythm to it. it. It impacts the size of the buildings. It impacts the, um, the feel of walking through the, the area. Uh, you miss it a little bit when you're driving, but you certainly feel it when you're riding a bike or walking through. And I think that um, for generations, people will appreciate that they have they have brought the, that block system into this neighborhood. And um, and that will be something that will make it feel very much like it's part of Eugene. I appreciate the enthusiasm you, you brought to that answer, Will. Um, I look forward to a, a friend or family member moving in and having a, a, a an IPA on the balcony, listen to a Cuthbert concert uh, in the summer. Uh, can you touch on uh, can you touch on on the mixed economy uh, in, our, in my last thirty seconds? I want to uh, I want to make it clear to those watching that there's a market rate for these units, and then there's affordable housing, federally subsidized units. Can we talk about the the um, the benefits to having a mixed economy? And will folks truly be living integrated? How will, is it like, you know, one floor is our subsidized housing, one floor, how, how does, how does, what's the vision with the developers in regards to a mixed economy on the site? Um, the vision of the mixed economy is not going to be quite as, um, as blended as what you just described there. The, um, the council in the direction of the agency board and in, in direction through all of this has, um, has identified the need to develop a minimum of 75 units that are 60% of area median income. Um, we have reserved parcel two for that. This is a parcel that's directly north of parcel three BC at fourth and mill. Um, so that that is one building where there will be um, per council direction, there will be those 75 units for people who make 60% AMI or less. The rest of the site um, the rest of the housing that's being developed by Atkins Dame will be uh, market rate. You've heard uh, Anne describe rents that they, um, in order to get to the returns that, uh, that Councillor Zelenka was asking about, returns that with the MUPTI barely crossed the lines of what we think are um, viable in today's market, um, they are uh, pushing for uh, very high dollar rents. 
the, the variables that come into this will be um, uh, that there are differences between the units. There's differences of size between the units. There's differences of location and views. And those things always come into play. Those are ways that you um, always have some sort of blend between price points um, in housing units. The other thing that you'll find, I think, you know, especially in a location like this, is that there will be people who will push harder to get into these units um, uh, and stretch their means more. And there will be people who will take advantage of the opportunity not to have um, a personal vehicle and, um, and throw their transportation budget into their housing budget. And there will be other people who um, maintain valuable cars and live here. And that will allow for people who might, um, who might not make that compromise and, and make that uh, uh, pushed uh, in other places to, to come in here. So there, there will be some variety, but it will not be, um, it will not be a, an entire cross-section of the community. Thank you, Will. Thank you. It looks like uh, Mike and Randy need another round. So take it away, Mike. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Ann, Councillor Keating suggested something, and I just want to have your comment on it because of something you said earlier. Would you say it's true that there are absolutely no accountability measures in this? that if someone doesn't meet the public benefit criteria, there's nothing to count that will happen to them for not doing so? I, I think actually Amanda D'Souza is probably the best place to answer that. We've got it, all of the public benefit criteria, there are, we have mechanisms to not give them the exemption if they fail to meet those criteria. Amanda, you, you know that topic way better than I do. <laughs> Yeah, there are multiple criteria that have follow-ups um, once the building's been constructed, and that's what the review panel reviews every year, what staff monitors. If there's ever a point where they are out of compliance with those requirements, we will bring it to council, and council can choose what the path is. Thank you very much. Matt, may, I may not have been clear. Uh, my recollection, and perhaps I'm wrong, is at the time of the passage of this, Alan wanted some much harsher and stronger clawback provisions than actually passed at the time. Um, I think it's important to say, <clears throat> well, th there's also the, the part you brought up, Alan, about the essentially the but for uh, provisions. And, and that's always the fight with this, that the folks put forward a, a presentation that says, if not, if we don't receive the muff MUFTI, we can't build it. We can't afford to build it. And to suggest that it would get built anyway, in most of those cases, is, in my opinion, not to understand the world of finance and not to understand how these things get funded by people loaning the money to do it, and calling an awful lot of people liars who put it in writing that they can't afford to build the thing without MUPTI. And if we look back over the last several years since this has been redone, there are an awful lot of new housing that exists that wouldn't if the MUPTI weren't there. And I understand my colleague's uh, desire to revisit this and to look at some of it. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. It's always wise to look back at things <clears throat> and say, does this work the way we thought it would? Um, but I would remind my colleagues that this particular um, policy, this particular program exists in a very delicate balance in the community. It, it got passed and it works and it exists now only because of, of a lot of argument seven years ago. If we were to alter it dramatically, I, I believe we, we risk the, the chance that this would lose a large scale of support and go away as a tool towards building more housing when we so desperately need it. So while I, I understand the desire to review, I, I would do that as well. I, I think changes are something we make, are, are something we, that I would suggest we be very careful about as not to upset the balance of this and have it become a tool that no one uses anymore that people would prefer to just play again. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Randy and then Alan, and then we'll wrap it up. Thank you, Mary. I'll, I'll try to be quick. I almost didn't ask this question because it really has nothing to do with the MUPTI, but it has everything to do with the successful use of the space. 
and this is for the city manager. I hope we are thinking about ways that we can maintain order in this area once it's established. You know, we've struggled with that downtown. We've struggled with basically the west half of the city with behavioral issues. And this is just gonna be another area that could be a problem spot if we don't think about that before we start occupying the space and using the space. And I just think it's important that in maybe in a future work session, when we get down to more details, that we hear a little bit about um, what your thoughts are, what the police chief's thoughts are, what um, the ambassador's thoughts are to, to keep this space safe and welcoming for everyone. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Alan, one more comment? Yeah, just uh, on that last point that Mike was talking about, before the reform of MUPTI, we didn't have an independent review of the of the pro forma. Um, in this, with with MUPTI re reform, we now do have a completely independent, and we got it in our packet review of the pro forma. So we can go and look at them side by side, which I did, and look at what's different between what the independent reviewer uh, PNW did and what the developer did and they pretty much track. So for me, that was, I got, I wanted that in the MUPTI reform because I wanted to be able to make sure that um, we could say, yeah, that makes sense. We probably, given this economics and all these assumptions at, at zero to 3% rate of return over the first 10 years versus uh, four to 6%, Yes, Mupti makes a difference, and this would be built at at less than you know two three percent. It's not going to get built, and that's really what was needed to be verified. And in this case, I think it actually does do that. So it's transparent and verifies that that actually um, through that independent consultant uh, is accurate. Okay, thank you all. I uh, a very interesting conversation and a lot of good questions. I, I'm just going to weigh in on a couple of things, which is that I don't have I don't have Claire's same trouble with the aesthetic on this. I actually, you know, I'm not so bothered by the way it looks. And um, but I, you know, I am curious about the fact that people are building with brick and we're in a Cascadia subdu subduction zone. And I don't really understand that why so many buildings are being built with brick, and so. Will it fall off? I don't know. Maybe it's just the facade. It doesn't matter, but I'm puzzled by that because we're seeing it all over town. Um, uh, the second thing is I, I actually, I appreciate the concern about the density, but I'm actually happier that these aren't quite as tall because I just feel there's just going to be sort of a nice feeling to this neighborhood. It's not, the buildings are not going to tower so much. And I just wanted to comment on the, on the MUPTI and the MUPTI changes, we had we had a dry spell here after council revised the MUPTI. We didn't get many applications and we had a number of projects that fell through. It was a pretty, I think as revised, turned out to be a pretty steep hill to climb for a lot of developers. And so it's been interesting that, you know, the the Gordon Lofts and the Ferry Street kind of kind of were the beginning of a new trajectory. So it, it as you know, in response to Claire's comments about why is this challenging, actually a quiet, tr applying for a MUPTI is pretty challenging. It's a lot of, uh, it, it, there's a lot of extra work that a developer has to do. And, and I'm assuming, and you know, any of you staff could respond to this, that part of the reason that it's worth it is because at the end, they're gonna build something that is very, a very significant investment. And so it's worth going through all this because it's a big enough building. It ultimately is gonna produce enough revenue. And so it's worth it for them to go through this pretty arduous process and approval process from the city. I'm seeing Denny nod that that's, that that's the case. So I'm, uh, I, I will, um, agree with all of my colleagues that I really appreciate having the chance to have this long conversation first before council is faced with the decision. I think you answered a lot of our questions and it's very interesting. In the end of the day, it's 300 and if it all goes through, it's 381 units. We need it. It's a spectacular site. We're gonna have a whole new neighborhood. I'm, 
I'm very excited about this, um, the, the prospect here of this going in. And um, so look, look forward to the next round of conversations and also agree that I think um, it is always good to sort of take another look at, a, at an ordinance like Mupti. Some people have objected to different parts of it over the past. And I think that might be a good idea um, just in general. So with that, thank you all very much for a wonderful meeting, a wonderful conversation, lots of good information. We are adjourned until 7.30. See you in a bit. Bye.